is hope, there is always hope. And there is peace in the storm, in the storm. Don't forget, He is Lord, He is Lord of all. The God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in his name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. So lift your eyes, stand in awe, stand in There is a King of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in His name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise, there is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. Bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one name. Over all, Jesus reigns. I know, I know. Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound. Just one day, move all, Jesus reigns, I know. God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in his name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. Well 
powerful God, but that not only are you powerful, but your power is extended to us, God, in every circumstance we find ourselves in. We thank you that you never leave us, you never give up on us, but your love follows us to the ends of the earth. We're so grateful for that. And we're going to sing this song together that we've been learning just a song that reminds us that no matter what kind of week you had, no matter what you might be facing, that we have a God who is facing it with us, and he's the same in every situation. Just not that hard to find 
hands and heartache all the same. something that we don't normally do but I thought we could just take a moment just to linger because each and every one of us is facing a mountain of some kind or you have someone in your life that you're facing a mountain with or for and so I thought we could just take just a moment, just a minute, and just respond to God without words on the screen, without a song to sing, and maybe your response is, God, everything is great, and I am so, so thankful. Or maybe your response is, God, I find myself, in the words of some of these songs, I am fighting a battle that I cannot fight on my own, and I need your help. Would you help me right now? Would you strengthen and encourage me on the inside right now? Or maybe there aren't words for what you're feeling and you just need to take a breath. You just need to take a moment to exhale. Just to breathe out all that stuff you've been carrying and just to breathe in the breath of God tonight. So as Brett plays, I just wanna invite you just to respond how you need to respond in this moment. God is here, he's meeting us here in this place. Just take a moment. so good to uh, remind ourselves just how close God is to us. So good. Hey, we're going to bring the lights up here in a second. And uh, as you grab a seat or before you grab a seat, turn to somebody. We're heading into this, this fall season. Uh, it means sports for a lot of people. For some people, it just means pumpkin flavored things. Uh, but maybe for you, it means sports. So what's a team or something you cheer on? Maybe it's just a sport or maybe it's like, that's not it. And you cheer for something else. You've got something else that you cheer on or that you're kind of into. Ask the person next to you, go for it. Well, welcome to Terra Nova. We are, maybe I, everyone's cheering on the Chargers because they need everything they can get right now. So week one was rough, but some, I heard some pumpkin spice. I, I'm in, I like chai, but that's as fall as I get. So I'm just so glad you're here tonight. My name is Ashley. Welcome to Terra Nova if you're a guest. Thank you so much for being here on this, you know, fall night. It really feels like fall today. I'm morning summer right now, but we're glad you're here. We hope you got some popcorn, take all the bags on your way out. And we're just so glad you're here tonight. Um, you got a weekend program when you came in. So if you can just take that out or pull out your Terra Nova app. We have a lot going on in there as well. You'll see we have your message notes in here. Um, lots of fun things coming up on our flyer. We have a dessert night coming up, a women's craft morning. You can check that out as well. But if you draw your attention to the back, you'll see that we have our connect card here. And this is something that is really hard to tear out. So just hold on one minute. I really struggle every time and I prepped it. I like folded it. Nope, I'm not doing it. It's some, mine's defective. John, mine's defective. Um, Yep, okay, so here it is. If you're a guest, we would love for you to 
tear this out better and fill this out. Let us know uh, who you are. If you have any boxes that you want to check on here because you're interested in something, you can also do that. You can write down your prayer request. We have a prayer team and our staff who would love to be praying for you. Um, so please write that down as well. We would love to get this back from everyone every week. And it's just a great chance for us to connect with you. So just be filling this out. You can write down your favorite team on here too. Why not? I love seeing what everyone's cheering for. I'm like, oh, probably the Chargers, right? So um, just be, oh yeah, okay, okay. But um, I'll let it slide this time. There's baseball or something too. But again, we're just so excited you're here. So drop this in the offering on your way out. Be working on it and let us know, um, let us know what's going on. You can fill it out on the app too if you're a digital person. So just be working on that. And you'll see also in this, uh, where'd it go? Okay, here it is. We have our fall life group brochure and we started our signups last week and we are just excited to start filling up these groups. Um, at Terra Nova, life groups are actually a huge part of who we are and what we do, and that's because we know and acknowledge that God did not create us to do this alone. God did not create us to do anything alone. We were just meant to be in connection. And speaking of alone, there's this really good show. It's called Alone. Um, I've been watching it for years. I feel like I was ahead of the time. Everyone's all into it now. I'm ahead of it. And basically, all these people are dropped in the middle of nowhere, and they have to survive in the wilderness alone. They're all separated. And whoever survives the longest alone wins. They win all this money. And they really hype up the viewers to think, oh, they're going to get out because, you know, they're not going to have the right shelter or the right food or the right whatever, but I have a degree in psychology and I said, nope, that's not what's gonna happen. I think they're going to go absolutely bananas being by themselves in their own thoughts all the time. And sure enough, all the people who get out from the beginning all tap out because they have like a mental breakdown from being alone, from having no human connection for days and months on end. And it made me think about the world we live in today, how easy it is just to hit that easy button and choose to be alone. Even in the past few years, the things we used to do together, a lot of times we choose to do alone now. And it's such a constant reminder that we weren't created to do that. We were not created to do anything alone. And I love that life groups are an opportunity for us to meet face to face, to share our story, to hear someone else's story, to ask questions, to come with our doubts, and it's a safe place to do that. Or to even have those moments where you're like, oh, I didn't know you were going through that. Me too. Like, I thought I was the only one. I thought I was alone in that. And what a cool space that we have to say, hey, you don't have to do this alone. And so our hope is that every single person here finds their fit, finds a group, finds a way to say, hey, I'm going to choose to be present at least once this week in the busyness and the craziness and slow down and find connection and to find community. And there's a group for everyone in here. I hope you find one for you. I picked out two groups. I'm like, I'm going for it this fall. Like, I'm not watching football. I don't have time for that. So I am so excited um, to just see where you find your fit. Again, it's so much easier to be alone, but it's sometimes it's just better to be together. And we really believe that. And we're so grateful you're here this weekend to choose to be together. And we just can't wait to continue to fill up all these groups. That's my goal. I'm like, I want everyone to stay full on the website, okay? Because I just want there to be such fullness of community this fall. Um, but again, if you're a guest, I hope you enjoy your time here tonight. Again, take all the popcorn, enjoy this really weird diverse family that we call Terra Nova. And we're just, we're just glad you're here. We actually started off a series last weekend called EQ. It's based on emotionally intelligent relationships. And we're gonna be diving into part two tonight. <laughs> Hey, welcome. How you guys doing? 
My name is John. Great to have you here. Uh, and uh, before we jump in tonight, I just wanted to uh, personally invite you to something. Next Sunday night, uh, there is a dessert night open house happening at my home. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an open house in that it's like 6 to 8 p.m. Just come anytime, drop by. And I wanted to personally, personally invite every single one of you uh, to come on by and have some dessert with us because my wife and I do not want to eat dessert alone. See how I did that? Uh, and, uh, and you wouldn't, well, actually, maybe you would. Uh, so it's a, it's a fantastic thing. Uh, and uh, bring the kids if you got them. Stop by for 10 minutes. Stay for the whole time, whatever you want. And uh, you can bring a dessert if you want to share a dessert. Or you can just uh, come and enjoy the desserts that other people bring. This is an actual picture of our last dessert night. No, it's not. Uh, that's like a professionally done deal. It was, uh, it was crazy, crazy good, though. Uh, and so my wife and I would just love to have you in our house. A bunch of our staff's going to be there uh, and probably a bunch of you. So it's a great way to meet some people. There's no agenda other than re relationships and calories. That's it. That's the only two things going on. So uh, I hope you'll come by. But as Ashley said, uh, we're in part two of this series called Emotionally Intelligent uh, Relationships, EQ. And you know what IQ is? IQ uh, is intelligence quotient. That's, that's how smart you are. Uh, but EQ is emotional intelligence. So you can think of it this way. IQ is book smart. EQ is people smart. And the two are not necessarily correlated at all. In fact, there are people who have very, very high IQs and off the chart SAT scores, but are very bad with people and with relationships and with emotions and such. And that's what makes this series a really important topic, especially for people who say they are followers of Jesus because following Jesus is all about becoming someone who loves, who loves really well, who loves really smartly, who loves intelligently, who loves as we have been loved. In fact, we said last week, we went so far as to say, you cannot be spiritually healthy and remain emotionally and relationally unhealthy. You can't be spiritually healthy and remain emotionally uh, and relationally unhealthy because this is what the Spirit of God wants to actually do in you and in me. He wants to bring us to a place of greater and greater emotional and relational intelligence and health, a place of emotional fortitude and relational generosity. That's what we talked about last week. And last week we defined uh, specifically what EQ is. And here's our working definition. Emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize your own emotions, regulate them, not so easy to do, and to understand and positively influence the emotions of others. And this whole idea of emotional intelligence was made famous by a guy named Daniel Goleman a generation or so ago in a best, best-selling book called Emotional Intelligence. But it was actually originally defined by a couple of psychologists named Peter Salavoy and John Mayer. John Mayer, the psychologist, not the singer, different guy. Uh, and John Mayer and, and Peter Salavoy identified five areas or five skills that, that they said emotionally intelligent people display. And those five are now commonly condensed into four quadrants. And we talked about this last week. There's uh, self-awareness, which is where it all begins. The ability to recognize and understand your own moods and emotions and drives, as well as how they impact other people. You're aware of it, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can do anything about it, which is the next stage of self-management. The ability to control or redirect disruptive impulses and moods, the ability to suspend judgment, to think before acting. What a beautiful thing to be able to do. And then in an ideal world, that self-awareness is starting to bleed into other people's social or relational awareness, the ability to understand the emotional makeup of other people, not just yourself, and skill in treating people according to their emotional needs, their emotional reactions, uh, the, the skill called empathy. And then together, the three of those ideally would combine into what's called relational or relationship management. I'll admit, I don't really love that phrase because most people do not want to be managed, right? Uh, but here's what it means. Proficiency in, in managing relationships or having relationships, sustaining great relationships, building networks, and an, and an ability to find common ground and build rapport. Four, four skills. And last week, uh, we began the series really where we should always begin anytime we're talking about anything, and that is with our, ourselves. So to start with ourselves, we talked about some very specific and practical things that we can do to increase our self-awareness and our emotional regulation, the first two skills of EQ, which are really all about in ways of increasing our capacity to love really well and to love smartly. Now, this week, we're going to begin to turn those skills outward to the people 
around us. Uh, my wife and I, Debbie and I, have been uh, binge watching a TV show on, on Netflix. I won't even tell you what it is. But in the show, the characters are super smart, high IQ people, cream of the Ivy League crop, geniuses really, but they are so emotionally and relationally dumb. I mean, it's incredible. It's stunning to see how badly they miss each other, misread, misread the moment, misread the, the emotional cues that are being sent to them to jump to the worst and always the wrong conclusions, to read their own fears and their own insecurities into the situation, to react based on those fears and insecurities and inevitably fulfill their fears and insecurities. And it's like, how can they be like, it's a constant train wreck, which of course is what the show's all about. It's just like drama, right? And I'll be thinking like, How can he miss that that badly? How can they misread each other? How can they be so poor at this when they're so smart? How can she be so blind? And then I'll think, I think this sometimes when I'm watching stuff, like you probably don't wanna watch stuff with me. I'll think, people don't actually do this, do they? People don't, people don't miss each other like this that badly, do they? People don't react like that, do they? Certainly people don't say those kinds of things, do they? And of course, they do. They do all the time. And as, as much of a train wreck as these characters are, the truth is uh, maybe not all the time and maybe not with everyone, but we all miss cues. We all miss cues. We all misread people, misread situations. And we all walk past and talk past and ignore and actually bulldoze over the signs and the signals that other people are trying to send us. In fact, I read this woman's post on the internet. She wrote, Uh, that her husband accused her of being moody and not smart. And uh, so we already know which category he falls in. So he bought her a mood ring. You remember these things, anybody old enough? We just dated ourselves right there. Uh, remember mood rings? And, and so the idea is you put it on and it changes color supposedly based on your mood. It's science, people, okay? It's science. And so he bought her this mood ring and he pressured her to put it on and wear it around so that he could tell what kind of mood she's in. And so she writes, she posts this, she goes, what we discovered is that when I'm in a good mood, the ring turns green. And when I'm in a bad mood, it leaves a big big red mark on his forehead. And then she says, maybe next time you'll buy me a diamond. But maybe not if that's what you're going to do with your ring. I don't know. But, but we all struggle to see the signs. We all struggle to read each other. We miss cues. We miss read people. And often enough, we miss them because honestly, we're not even trying in that moment. So today, I want to talk about a bedrock principle of EQ or emotional intelligence. It's the third skill in our four quadrants, the social awareness, the ability to actually read people, that empathetic ability to see where people are coming from, to feel that, and then to adapt ourselves according to that moment. And I believe this skill is most powerfully uh, illustrated in what I personally think is the most amazing and most unbelievable story in all of the documents that are combined to be referred to as the, as the Bible or to Biblia, the books. Uh, it's a document, it's a biography of Jesus' life written by John. And maybe you've heard of John or St. John. He was one of uh, Jesus' uh, 12 closest disciples. He was so close to Jesus. Think about this, that when Jesus was dying on the cross, Jesus asked John to take care of his mom for him. Like you think about who that is in your life. Like who, who, who would that be? Like, I'm going to leave my mom with you because I trust you with my mom. That was John. John saw everything. He'd been with Jesus the whole time, saw all the miracles, heard all of what Jesus taught. He saw Jesus die. He saw an empty tomb. And then afterwards, according to his own eyewitness testimony and everyone else's, John saw Jesus after he died. He had meals with him, walked with him, long lingering conversations with him. He was an eyewitness. And as John grew older, he decided that it was time to to write his own story down. There were already some other biographies of Jesus and parts of Jesus' story that were being told and passed around. There there are three of them that have... uh, been preserved throughout history. We actually have them uh, written by people that John knew well, and John was probably very familiar with their biographies of Jesus, written by guys like Matthew and Mark and Luke. But John wanted to write his story. Like, this is... I want to tell the story of what it was like to be a part of that, to be a part of those days. And John begins his story of Jesus, his biography, in a little bit of an unusual way. Matthew and Luke 
Both begin with stories of Jesus' birth. So as Christmas comes near, that's right, I said that. Christmas comes near, we'll, we'll, you know, we're always turning to stories of Matthew and Luke and the, you know, so forth. Uh, Mark's biography of Jesus is the most quick-paced, action-packed. He's like the J.J. Abrams of Jesus' biographers. But John, years after the others have already written, he steps back and he says, I need to set this whole story and what we saw and experienced in a bigger context. And John takes us back to the very beginning. And he opens his story with the verbatim words of the Hebrew scriptures that he had grown up hearing from his earliest childhood in the beginning. In the beginning was the word and, and the word was, was with God. And at the same time, somehow the word was God. In the beginning, there was, there was this this words, like word, what, what's that? Like, what's he, what's he talking about? Well, John is writing to a Greco-Roman audience. He's writing in ancient Greek and their word for word was the word logos. And so he's saying in the beginning was the logos. And in Greek philosophy, like Plato and Aristotle in particular, uh, logos, uh, which is our, our word for logic, if, to the Greeks, logos was the unifying principle behind all uh, uh, of reason and logic that, lied, that uh, lies behind the material world. It governed the universe. It was superior to the physical world, but just as real. And that's what logos meant in, in much of the audience John's writing to. But John's a Jewish guy. And John grew up hearing and memorizing the stories of the Hebrew scriptures. And in Genesis, the very first book of the Hebrew scriptures, God speaks and the worlds come into existence. God says a word and it happens like heaven and earth, trees, sky, grass, oceans, birds, fish, everything explodes into being with just words. And to Jewish people in John's day, the word of God was an active force. It was the creative power behind all of life that brings the worlds to life. But more than the power behind creation, the word of God to them was the source of God's message to people. God's word brings light to the darkness. It brings enlightenment and guidance to us. And so he goes on to say, in him, in him was life. And that life was the light of all people and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not understood it or comprehended it. And for the first time in the story, we get a sense that something might actually be wrong. The darkness doesn't understand the light. What's that mean? Doesn't comprehend the light. I mean, clearly he's talking about like creation, you know, the, the universe right in the beginning, but he also seems to be talking about like something else too. There's another kind of light or enlightenment and another kind of darkness. And then John begins to explain. Verse 10 of chapter 1, he says, He was in the world. And that though, though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. It's like, okay, wait a minute. Who's, who's he, John? Like the logos, the light? Who is he? He came to that which was his very own. And the idea is that, what, that which belonged to him, like his own property, his own house. Like he came, to, he came to his own house and he was treated like a stranger. And he was treated like he was unwelcome. His own did not receive him. But then John says, but not entirely. There were some who did receive him. There were some who did receive him who, and then he says that another way, who believed in his name. And that, that, to, to say believed in his name, in this sense, his name is more than like the label to which he's called or referred to. The name, a person's name in the ancient world, and really in, in, in a big way in our world too, it's a person's character. It's their honor, their reputation. It's the person themselves. In other words, for those, for those who did welcome him, for those who recognized him and welcomed him and accepted him, to those who trusted him and believed him, he gave the right to become children of God, spiritually born sons and daughters of God himself. It's like, wow. But hold on, like, hold on, but time out, John. Wait, wait, wait. Who's he? Like, who are we talking about here? So are you suggesting, John, that the one who made the, the, made the world came to the world? 
that this word who was with God and somehow was God came, the, maybe uh, like you're talking about like a metaphysical way, just kind of revealed himself to all people as somehow. And that's when John makes it really concrete and unambiguous so that there is no question about what and who he is talking about. Here's what he says next. The word became flesh. The word, that creative expression of God, the power behind all creation, the, the rational, uh, logical reason or schema behind everything that exists, the source of all light and life, the word who was, in fact, somehow God himself, divine, became human. What? Became flesh and bone. Now, the word that theologians use for this big, big idea is the word incarnation, which means to embody something, uh, a trait, a quality, or an idea, to embody it, to put skin on it, to uh, make something that's somewhat intangible, to make it visible and tangible so you can touch it. God incarnate. God wrapping himself in skin and bone and a truly human life, moving into our world, making his dwelling among us, setting up shop in the house next door that God had somehow, and he goes, John's like, and we saw it. That's what we saw. There's no other way I can explain what it was like to be with him those years than we, we were eyewitnesses to glory that God had somehow stepped into our situation, entered into our world with us. And on the one hand, if you're paying attention to what John's saying here, it is the most unbelievable thing anyone could ever say out loud. But then on the other hand, if God is, and can we just maybe posit this as a, as a thought experiment? If it just might be that God is the most relationally intelligent and relationally healthy being in the universe, if there is a God, he might actually be the most relationally intelligent being in the universe, if that would be true. Well, then of course he would do this. Of course he would do this because that's what emotionally intelligent people do. So, so how do you connect with someone that you want to connect with? whether it's your teenager or your mom or your, the potential client or uh, a, a new date, a new boyfriend, a new girlfriend, or the people at a new job you've just taken or a new roommate. How do you bridge that space between you and other people? How do you succeed in an office filled with diverse and different people and personalities and ideas and points of view? And how do you connect with somebody you're at odds with who isn't receiving you? Someone where the relationship isn't really going well. And what God did for fallen humanity, for a fallen creation that had withdrawn from him, that was unreceptive to him, his unrecepted loved ones, what God did is actually one of the most basic skills that you and I need to develop in order to be effective in love in business, in sales and friendship, in parenting, in conflict resolution. Ultimately, what God did is the most literal expression of putting yourself in their skin, of walking in their shoes for a bit. And first followers of Jesus would take this story and they would set it up again and again and again as the, as the model for our relationships with everyone, that we do that same thing. It's the bedrock principle of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence 101, step out of your own world and enter theirs. Step out of your own world and enter theirs. It is a selfless, selfless, self-sacrificial, Christ-like loving act to leave my story, to leave my head, you know, my, my world, my space, and try, dare I might, to, to, to enter in to the other person's experience, to try to see what, what we're going through from their side, through their eyes, to step out of my world and step out of my story and step out of myself and try as I can to enter theirs. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, I know, I know, I know, I know. This is so familiar, John. This is like empathy. Okay, we got it. Maybe it's actually a little too familiar. It's the kind of thing that everybody has probably heard before. None of that is new. It's like, I heard that, of course, of course. But so often, and especially under pressure, it might be something we, we know, but it is not something we actually do, right? In fact, consider this real life um, uh, example. A teenage daughter comes home 
Uh, and she's really down. She just seems really down. And so her mom is like, uh, hey, honey, what, what, you know, what's going on? What's wrong? Uh, to which she responds, nothing, nothing. I'm, I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. And the mom says, no, no, no. Come on, honey. Tell me how you feel. What's going on? I know it's hard, but I'll try to understand. I don't know, mom. You're just, you're just going to think it's stupid. Of course I would. Of course not. You can tell me no one cares for you as much as I do. I'm only interested in your welfare. What's making you unhappy? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Come on, honey. What is it? Well, to tell you the truth, I hate school, mom. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I don't want to be there anymore. I don't want to go there anymore. I want to get my GED and get out of there as quickly as I can. What? What do you mean you hate school? You don't hate school. And after all of the sacrifices that we've made for your education, education is the foundation for your future. And if you just applied yourself like your sister does, you would do better and then you would enjoy it. I mean, you have what it takes. You've got the ability, but you just don't apply yourself. You, you, need, a better, you, you need a better attitude. You need to try harder. Now go ahead, honey. Tell me how you feel. That's what we do. That is what we do. When something doesn't fit, we push harder. When someone doesn't understand, we talk louder and often longer, sometimes a lot longer. When something's not moving fast enough, we hurry it up. When somebody's not getting what we're trying to make them do, we put more pressure on. We do not seek to understand and step into their world and get out of our own world. We don't have time for that nonsense. Often we don't have the emotional bandwidth for that that kind of move. And frequently, we don't even have the ability, which is what I find so fascinating and amazing about Jesus. I mean, it's just so incredible that God didn't just enter into our world and into our story in some kind of broad, cosmic, generic sense. When God stepped into our world, he modeled this kind of relational intelligence, this kind of attunement to other people on a daily, daily basis, maybe like no one had ever done before. Jesus had this way of dropping everything, of focusing on people, of entering into their story, uh, meeting them right where they were at in that moment, paying attention to individuals, especially to individuals that other people were less likely to ever pay attention to. He touched lepers. He, he hangs out at a drinking hall with a scandalous woman. He spends an afternoon at a tax collector's house. One time on his way, you need to know uh, to, to meet a, a, a very urgent, in fact, life or death need and request. He's touched by this hemorrhaging woman who has told herself, if I can just touch him, if I can just touch his robe, not even him, I would be healed. And she touches him and he stops. And apparently the entire entourage stops of two, oh, two of course. Apparently he and the others sit with this woman long enough so that in, in Mark's biography of Jesus, Mark says, she told him, she told them all the whole truth about what had happened to her. Now, how long does it take to hear somebody's whole truth? Are you kidding me? He's on his way to an urgent need, the whole truth. I mean, I can't, I can't even put myself in those shoes. It's like, I'd be like, um, I'm so sorry. Oh, that just, oh, the doctors did what? I'm so sorry. Could, could we just maybe just can, lady, I'm sorry, bad story. I gotta go. These people are waiting for me. Boundaries, right? We gotta have some boundaries around here. And Jesus, when he sees people, he stops everything over and over again. There are so many stories like this. He enters into their story, enters into it with them. And that allows him to connect their story to God over and over again in this incredibly intuitive, perceptive, adjusted individual way. It's amazing. It's fascinating. And that is like this high watermark for relational intelligence. What relational intelligent people not just know, but it's what they're able to do to step out of their own world and actually enter into the world of the other person. So 
Since this is something we've kind of all heard before, empathy, right? We all know, but don't always do, or maybe hardly ever do. I want to take the rest of our time today to talk about how to do this. Every week in the series, we're ending with something that we hope will be incredibly practical. But this week, I want it to be very memorable as well. I hope that you think about this phrase over and over again throughout the week. I want to use this really common phrase uh, that's often used to teach kids to pay attention when they get to an intersection or a street to not wander mindlessly into danger. And the phrase is, you've heard this before, stop, look, and listen. Okay, so let's say that out loud, all of us, one, two, three, stop, look, and listen. And I want us to use that. I hope that echoes in your head all week long. I want us to use this phrase this week to make us alert when we find ourselves in relational intersections, which we do all the time, uh, when, so that we do not mindlessly wander into danger in that relationship. We're going to, one more time, what is it? Stop, look, and listen. Hey, I just need to stop, look, and listen. I just need to stop, look, and listen. Here's what I mean by that. Stop. By stop, I mean to focus your full attention. Just hard stop. Just go, okay, I just need to stop. In order to become a person who reads other people really well, like Jesus, I have to stop doing a lot of the things that I really like to do. I need to stop talking. I need to stop the mental monologue that is constantly running in my head. I need to stop the screen. I need to pause the TV, set down the phone. I need to stop. I need to stop or at least pause my agenda. I don't know about you, but often I have an agenda when I'm walking into a relational situation. I just need to put that on pause. I need to stop anticipating what the other person is going to say. I need to stop assuming I know what they mean. Stop thinking ahead. Stop my judgments about what they are saying. To stop, when you think about it, to stop in this way is truly an act of self-sacrifice. It really is an act of self-sacrifice, stepping out of my story, my head, my world, so that I can enter into the other person's story, whether that's my teenager or a date or a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a spouse, a coworker, my mom, whoever, I need to stop. I need to stop. Now, the problem is we often think we can pick up everything we need to pick up. Like I can read, I, I, I got it, I got it. We can pick up what we need to pick up without this really focused effort, without really stopping everything else. But studies have shown again and again, we are wrong about that. We are actually very wrong. Studies show that when our attention is split, even a little bit, between what someone is trying to express and something else that's going on, we tune out. We tune out just enough that we miss crucial details, especially the emotional details that are on someone's face because we're not paying full attention. To, to stop really is to step out of my own story. Just for a second, okay? Just for a second, just for a few moments to step out of your own story. And then number two, look. Look, and by that I mean observe the signs. Notice, notice the signs. Pick up the cues that are, that are coming at you. In fact, you've heard this before. Communication experts say that somewhere around 90% of communication, especially the emotional part of communication, is nonverbal. You've probably heard that before. That people's stories, and especially their emotions, uh, are usually not put into words, and usually, at very least, not put into words very well or very accurately. And we know this is true because we all stink at it often enough, right? Most of the time, we don't know, really even know what we mean in that moment. Well, I'm not, that's not what I meant. What I'm, and we don't even know what we feel, as so many of you told me over the course of your, this week, asking yourself what you feel and why. It's like, that was not easy. We don't even know. It's not often expressed well, but our stories and our emotions are almost always expressed, either subtly or dramatically on our bodies, on our body language and our posture, our shoulders, our gestures, our tone of voice, and especially, especially our faces. And people are sending you hundreds of signals all day long with their bodies. They're sending you signals like, hey, keep talking. Like, I, I'm with you. I agree. Hey, I would like to say something. Can, 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 can I add to that? Like, I would like to jump in too. I'm feeling stressed. I'm really distracted right now. I don't think you understand me. I don't think you get what I'm trying to say. I disagree with you. Ouch, that kind of hurt. I'm enjoying this interaction. I'm bored. You lost me. Stop talking. I wish I was in the Bahamas. I wish you were in the Bahamas. People are sending us signals and messages all the time without saying a word. 
And emotionally intelligent people are great at receiving those messages, at picking up on them. They notice the signs. They can read people. They can read the moment. They can read the vibe. They can read the room. The second step is stop and look. Just observe and notice. So this week, try to pay attention to the physical signs that people are going, giving you all day long. Just this week, part of your homework is like, I'm just going to try to notice. Look at people's faces and ask yourself. Last week, we, we said, hey, ask yourself what you're feeling and why. This week, look at other people's faces and just ask yourself, yeah, I wonder what they're feeling and why. What are they feeling? What does that look? What does that say? Watch body language. Wa listen to tone of voice for interest and energy and emotion. Their shoulders, their, their, their posture. Watch. And here's, a, here's a, like a bit of a homework exercise for you. If you find yourself in a group uh, sometime this week, maybe it's a study group or a work group or a, a management team meeting or a mom's group or a life group or something, you find yourself in a group, here's what I would suggest you do. Take just a mental break at some point in that group from your own active participation, kind of step mentally away and play anthropologist just for like a couple of minutes. Play observer of the group for just a little bit. Of course, if you're all in the same group, that might not work well because everybody's just like, so maybe not a group of these people, but just play like this observant role where all you're doing for a little bit is just watching the room, watching the group, watching the dynamics, looks on faces, energy levels, who talks to who and who doesn't, how eyes glance away and so forth. Watch the room and ask yourself, what might they be feeling? What do I see? Now, quick disclaimer, this is so important, like warning, danger, danger, danger. Just because you're seeing a reaction or a sign does not mean you know what it means. I know you think you know what it means, but just because you're seeing someone react does not mean you know what they mean. That look of uh, annoyance that you might, or, or, or disagreement you might interpret that way might simply be a distraction. Like something happened that made them think of something else that is kind of disruptive in their life and a look flashed across their face. You don't know what the look is. You just know it's something. So stop with your interpretations or your judgments or your assumptions or my interpretations and judgments. Just look, just look, see what you can notice. And then very important, listen. And by listen, I mean, really listen like for the meaning, for meaning. Listen for meaning to draw out the meaning behind the look, behind the words, really listen. Uh, one of my uh, favorite sayings of wisdom, and we talked about this document in the Hebrew scriptures called the book of Proverbs. Uh, one of my all-time favorite ones, I talk about this all the time because I love it so much, goes like this. The purposes of the human heart are deep waters, deep waters. Now, in the ancient Near East, uh, deep water referred to that which was chaotic and confusing and dark and mysterious, like who knows what's going on down there. Like the purposes of the human heart are a little bit like that. And, and, and it's a great proverb because it's just so true. It's so true true because it visually dip, uh, depicts the frustration we all feel in trying to figure other people out. It's like, it's just deep water. We all can relate to feeling misunderstood and struggling to understand someone, right? Men complain that they can't figure women out, vice versa, women complain about men, and parents try in vain to figure out their kids, oh my goodness, and kids think their parents come from outer space, like those just really weird people. Employers and employees are constantly locked in this battle that neither one actually understands what's important to the other or what's really going on. In fact, we probably have all, every single one of us had an experience or maybe multiple, this week, where we did not really feel understood, like they were not getting me. I just, I just, they didn't understand. I couldn't quite get them to understand what's going on with all of this. It's deep water. This is deep water. I mean, we don't even know what's down inside our own hearts half the time, but this is brilliant. But the proverb says, a person of understanding, oh, a person of understanding, they, they draw that out. They draw purpose. They draw meaning out. E emotionally intelligent people, people of understanding are great extractors of meaning. They try to figure out what's really going on. What do you mean? So they ask good questions, not leading questions. They draw others out. They're curious. They're insatiably curious about what people are going. Like they, they listen actively, uh, not just to what's being said, because we often struggle to put the real meaning into words. They listen behind the words. 
words? They're like, so what, when you said that, what did you mean by that? I don't assume I know. In fact, I assume I'm probably wrong. Even if I know you pretty well, I'm curious. I'm just curious. I wonder what that look meant, meant for you. What did that mean for you? What, what was that? Help me understand. How do you, how do you, I wonder how you feel so differently about this issue than I do because it just makes so much sense to me and you don't see it. Like, I'm curious. I wonder what it's like to see things through your eyes. I wonder what it's like to, to what it feels like in your skin. I want to get, I want to get to your story, which is always <laughs> expressed very imperfectly through your words. I want to understand. I want to understand. I'm just curious. And in fact, the more, the more confusing your response is, the more different it is than I would think would be my response, the more curious I am. Like that is, wow, you came to that conclusion? I have got to hear your story, right? I want to understand. So this week, what are we going to do? We're going to do these three things. Let's say them out loud together again. We're going to, what is it? Just let that rattle around in your head all week long. Hey, stop looking, listen, stop looking, listen. And then emotionally intelligent people who ex excel at this third skill of social awareness, they do one more thing, and this is pretty genius. Uh, they reflect back their interest in understanding. They actually reflect it back. In fact, Robert Rosenthal uh, made his name as a Harvard uh, researcher. He eventually moved out to California to retire and then became a uni university professor at UC Riverside. I don't know how you call that retirement, but uh, brilliant, like made a name, a whole, you know, leading cutting edge kinds of things. Uh, but he, he specialized in nonverbal communication, in nonverbal cues and empathy, how we pick those up. And Ro Rosenthal's studies focused in part on something he called rapport. Rapport, which Rosenthal referred to as relational magic. Rapport, having rapport with someone is relational magic. And having rapport is what, uh, what he used it to refer to as when people are just in sync. You know that feeling like, man, we were just connecting. We were just in the same place. Like we were on the same wavelength. And when people are in sync, he, his study showed like we feel energized. We're more creative. We're more effective in decision making. We work better together. We feel feel closer to one another, whether you're a couple planning a vacation or a, a, a management team mapping out a strategy, or it's your life group or neighborhood barbecue or family night rapport is like relational magic. And Rosenthal defines three ingredients of rapport uh, through his studies. And here's what they are. Uh, mutual attention, shared feeling, and then what he calls nonverbal coordination, he refers to it like there's a synchrony that starts to happen. And studies show we begin to match each other physically. In fact, in some studies, people's heart rates synced up. Their heart rates, their hearts began to beat at the very same way. This, this idea of rapport, in other words, what's happening here is my interest and my energy and my emotion and my body language is matching with yours. We are in harmony. We are in synchrony. It's the kind of thing that the Apostle Paul talked about in one of his letters where he said, rejoice with those who rejoice. Even if you're not feeling that, you just re rejoice with them. Mourn with those who are mourning, even if you're having the best day ever. Live in harmony. Live in sync. Live in tune with each other. Uh, whether it's like my coworker is excited about an accomplishment, hey, reflect that back. I'm having kind of a bad day, but man, hey, high five. Like, good for you. Congratulations. I'm so excited to hear that. My, my four-year-old is sad that her best friend is moving away. Reflect that back. Oh, honey, I'm, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. My friend is sharing some really difficult news. Is it, man, tough, tough, tough stuff. I reflect that back. Oh, Man, I'm just so sorry to hear that. My heart breaks for you. Before, 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 I try to encourage. This is what we do, especially sometimes Christians or religious people, but maybe it's just your personality. Before we try to encourage and prop them up and smooth things over, like, hey, it'll be okay. It's gonna be okay, dear. You don't have it. God's got this. God's in control. That is out of tune. That is out of tune. That is missing them. And they are guaranteed to not feel understood. I step out of my world, out of my story, out of how my day is going. I enter theirs and I adjust my energy, my interest, my, my body language, my emotion to sync up with theirs in the moment. And then I reflect that tone, those words, that body language back. And when I'm reflecting what I'm receiving, I'm reflecting interest and I'm reflecting 
understanding. It's that feeling you get sometimes when you go, man, they get me. They, they understood where I was coming from. On the other hand, when people are out of tune, when leaders are not reading and responding to their teams, when salespeople are not picking up the signs from the client that they are, they are just like bulldozing through, when spouses are missing each other, when friends are missing each other, when parents don't dial into their kids, when someone does something or says something in the group that just doesn't fit, it's odd, we have this subtle sense that something's just off. Like, oh, that kind of broke the vibe or that kind of crushed it. Now, here's, it doesn't mean that we can't disagree or push back at times with things that are being said, but there are ways to disagree that are in tune and there are ways of disagreeing that are really out of tune. And when someone, when, when one person botches attunement, just kind of blows it, the others in the group feel uneasy, been there, kind of awkward, like, gosh, I... I don't even really know what to say, misunderstood, frustrated. It's kind of like something's out of tune. Like there was this music that was starting to play and now there's something incredibly discordant, discordant and dissonant and maybe we don't even know why. And in emotionally intelligent people, they have this way of adjusting, of reading, reading what's going on, reflecting that back, being in tune with the other people. And for many, it seems to come instinctively and kind of naturally, which is amazing. But research shows it is a skill that can be learned. You can teach yourself to adjust your tone, energy, body, body language, and so forth to the moment. And emotionally intelligent people have a way to do this. Now, really quick, there is a reason why this isn't going to work. You should just know that. You should be forewarned. Even if you try, it might just be an epic, epic fail when you try to do this. And to discover why, you have to come back next week as we talk about the number one reason why everything I just said is just going to blow up in your face and not really work even when you actually do try. But this week, this week, here's your homework. We're just going to focus on this, this emotional intelligence skill of stepping out of our world and stepping into their world. Just this, this way of doing it. It's what God did for us. It is the epitome of love, of self-sacrificial love. It is the essence of the way of Jesus, by the way. And we all kind of know that that's a good idea, but it's not something we necessarily do, at least not very often, and not with difficult situations. So this week, what are we going to do? What are our words? We're going to stop, look, and listen. We're going we're gonna to focus our full attention we're going we're gonna to look for the signs. We're just going to try to read. I'm an, I'm an observer. I'm trying to pick this up. I'm going to draw out the meaning as best I can. And then I'm going to try, bonus round, to reflect back my interest and my understanding to them. Let me close this in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we just want to pause and say thank you for loving us that much. What an incredible act of love. It's, it's one that we struggle to emulate. And you love us that way. You have loved us that way, that self-sacrificially that you stepped out of your space and into ours so that we could know you, so that we could relate to you, so we could have synchrony or harmony with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And there's this line in, in John's story where he says, you know, a lot of people didn't welcome that. They didn't receive that. But for those who do, for those who receive it, those who welcome it, who put their trust in this, this logos, this word, this light, they become children of God, spiritually born sons and daughters of God. And if you've never done that before, I just want to give you a moment right now to say, God, I welcome you. I welcome you. I receive you with open arms. I, 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 want, I want to learn more about you. I want, to, I want to learn more about what this means. I would love to be your daughter. I would love to be your son. I say yes to you tonight. Father, for all of us, I pray as we go into this week, we'd just be mindful enough to watch those relational intersections, to stop, look, and listen, to, to seek to build this skill actively into our lives so that we would just be better lovers like you. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, hey, thanks so much for joining us uh, on your way out. Just want to remind you about that Connect card that Ashley told you about. We would love to hear from you. And again, if you're our guest, gosh, thank you for spending part of your weekend with us. Love to get to know you just as much uh, about yourself that you feel comfortable uh, telling us about. And you can th drop these in the offering baskets on the way out. You can drop that entire Life Group brochure in the baskets on the way out. And uh, you can drop offering envelopes in the baskets on the way out. Then I hope you'll join us back uh, next week, part three, as we discuss 
why nothing I said will work for you. Uh, and you might want to know why that is. And then, of course, next Sunday night, we got the dessert night over my house. I hope you'll all come out and hang with us there. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic week. Stopping, looking, and listening. We'll see you back next weekend.